define the financial services industry, a vision they began to pursue in 2004 with the conversation at the dinner table. Pooling all of their financial resources, which amounted to $135,000, the trio opened the doors to Advisors XL in 2005. Ten years later, the company, uh, Topeka-based company is an industry leader assisting independent financial advisors across the country. Cody is from Stockton, Kansas and received a Bachelor of Arts in Mass Media in 1999. He worked as a Director of Marketing before co-founding Advisors XL and Cody is a member of Sigma Phi Epsilon fraternity. Uh, Derek is from Silver Lake and received a Bachelor of Business Administration degree in 1999. He worked as a Sales Director before co-founding Advisors XL. Uh, Derek was a member of the Washburn Golf Team. Uh, David, who's not here with us today, but is from Benton, Kansas, and received a Bachelor of Business Administration degree in 1998. He worked as a Director of Annuity Sales before joining Cody and Derek to form their company. He's also a member of Sigma Phi Epsilon Fraternity. Please join me in welcoming Cody and Derek. We're going to have them come forward, and the rest of our platform party, let's move out to the seats, okay? Our format today is a little different than what you're maybe accustomed to if you've attended other wake-ups. Instead of having them make the presentation, I'm actually going to ask a series of questions uh, for them to answer, and then we'll open up uh, at the end for questions from our audience. Um, for starters, tell us a little more about yourself, um, including what brought you to Washburn, and what were some of the things you enjoyed most about your Washburn experience? Uh, I grew up in Silver Lake, Kansas, and wanted the opportunity to play golf, and thankfully Coach McHenry up here in the front row uh, gave me that opportunity. So that's really what drew me to Washburn. Um, what, a, what an amazing experience. I mean, looking at the campus now compared to what it was uh, 15 years ago, it's amazing how much the school has grown. Uh, but, but just had a great time at Washburn. It's a great um, local family type atmosphere. Uh, I did see Dr. Baker. He came up to me when I first got here. And, I could just see it in his eyes, it's like, is this this knucklehead that was in my business class? <laughs> see, it, miracles do happen, Dr. Bay, Dr. Masichek as well, so, uh, just a tremendous experience at Washburn, so. So, I actually knew I was coming to Washburn pretty early in my high school career. Uh, I grew up in a small town in western Kansas, Stockton, as they mentioned, and uh, grew up in a family with, you know, I say all the time we weren't lower class, but we probably straddled that line a little bit. So, Trying to figure out how I was going to pay for college was always a, uh, an interesting thing as I was making my way through high school. And I got lucky to grow up in a county where a gentleman named Duffy Hyman had actually endowed a scholarship to uh, come to Washington. So I think that started in the, the late 80s. And when I came here in 95, it virtually paid for all of the expenses associated with coming to school here. So it was a no-brainer for me really early on. Actually, a couple of my best friends that were a year older than me came to Washburn, so uh, it was an easy choice. I knew probably going into my junior year I was going to come here. So, you know, looking back, as Derek said, the, the campus has changed quite a bit uh, from when we were here. It's a lot more stuff to do now than, than when I went to school here. So, I would say, and uh, I was just talking to someone last night about this, you know, Washburn for me was about the people that I met here more than anything else. So, just developed some uh, lifelong friendships. This wasn't said that Dave and I were actually roommates at Washburn, so we've known each other for uh, right at 20 years now. So uh, make, made it easy to work together with someone that you've known that long, and those ties go way, way back. So. Thank you. Uh, lots of people around Topeka are curious about your business. Uh, they see that you moved in to what was the Ed Marlings building, and they know you were active in the community, but they don't know what you do. In a nutshell, what is Advisors XL? <laughs> It's okay, we still got family members that don't know for sure. <laughs> and, and it's actually a really, really easy business uh, to explain. So we ultimately provide uh, financial products to independent financial advisors all across the country uh, to sell to their clients. So we represent, uh, we kind of sit in the middle between them and these different financial institutions. So we represent about 45 different uh, insurance companies so uh, locally, companies like Aviva, who was here for a long time, uh, Security Benefit, uh, bigger names that everyone would know, like a Prudential or John Hancock from Transamerica. 
Um, so a financial advisor, instead of trying to figure out you know, which product and have to go to each company and figure out what their products are, they can come to us, we'll go shop you know, 40, 45 companies for them and find the best products for their clients. Uh, we've added kind of an asset management arm to that, so we do a lot with uh, Fidelity and helping them get set up. But um, while that's like technically what we do, I think where we've had some success is we realized early on, and this was in 2004, Dave and I left a company that we were working at that did this very thing and thought we were going to go be independent financial advisors. So we started up here in town and uh, we've been working with them for about four years and thought it would be pretty easy. And really early on we realized that it wasn't going to be quite as easy as we thought it was. So um, the, the business is or the people that we work with, the independent financial advisors, what they really are small business owners that happen to pro provide financial service products. So our business, we've really focused on how can we support and add some value uh, to their business to make them the best small business owner that we possibly can. So that's in, um, included a lot of different things, but it's really fueled a lot of the employee growth that we've had uh, at Advisors Excel. So anything to add? That looks great. <laughs> How does Advisors Excel differentiate itself from other insurance marketing organizations? You know, uh, as Cody just mentioned, it's, it's really all about the value add. We have roughly, you could call it 200 competitors across the country. We all have access to uh, similar products and similar investment companies, but uh, things such as we have a complete full-blown uh, ad agency, if you will, uh, in, inside our company, a creative team that helps our advisors build their brand. Uh, we have a radio department internally that will help our advisors uh, co-host the radio shows. Uh, we'll write all the content for them and uh, negotiate with all the radio stations across the country. Um, there's just a ton of value add that goes in that, that our competitors, a lot of them don't offer. Again, they just offer the products, but it's all that value add that really makes the advisor and that business owner successful in the field uh, is where we've been able to kind of carve out our niche. I'd say yeah, to add on that, I think we always have focused on two things. One is that, that value. So how can we provide more value um, than anybody else out there when we ultimately have kind of the same product to sell? But the second thing that I think we focus uh, a lot on, and you know, you see it here, at, I think, with the transformation of the campus is the experience. So a big part of what, you know, we try to drive into to everyone at Advisors Excel, all the people who work there, is that Ultimately, it's about the experience that we can provide. So we think, you know, if you can provide the best value or the most value and the best experience, that you're going to win quite a bit there. So uh, I understand the three of you pooled uh, all of your savings and retirement funds, took out second mortgages, more or less. You risked it all to start Advisors XL. What drove your decision to leave your current jobs and start your own company? I hate going to work. <laughs> um, I didn't enjoy working where, where we were working at, and uh, it was a great learning experience, but I think ultimately I always knew I kind of wanted to own my own business. I grew up, uh, my grandparents both were entrepreneurs, my dad was an entrepreneur, so I always knew that I wanted to own my own business. And after I think four years, you know, the last two of which I kind of dreaded getting up and going to work every day and just didn't enjoy the atmosphere or the environment that I was working in decided that I was ready to, uh, to leave and go start my own. So I, I would say I don't know that Derek would probably say the same thing. I don't know that we ever really viewed it as a risk. Um, you know, at that time we really hadn't accumulated much, so it's not like we had a lot that we were necessarily giving up from that standpoint. So I think ultimately we always thought that we would do okay. I don't think we ever envisioned uh, the company growing into what it is today from that standpoint. But I don't know that we ever really viewed it as like this big risk. I know it, you know it makes for a great story and it sounds good, but you know, I think we were confident that we could do a few things well um, that would let us be successful. I don't think we thought it would be successful in this, this degree. So I am speaking for the three of us, we're all wired uh, pretty similar as we don't work real well in an environment where we can't control our own destiny. You know, we were all uh, worked our way up through leadership and, you know, working next to someone that you know is working maybe not as hard as you and not get as much accomplished and making the same amount of money uh, just didn't, didn't really work well for us. So, you know, having that ability, if things aren't going well, uh, we look at the three or we look at ourselves in the mirror and the buck stops there. So, we like that environment. 
You could never work for someone else again. <laughs> Why Topeka? Uh, you could have located your business anywhere. Are there particular advantages or disadvantages to being located here in town? You know, we get asked that a lot. Our comeback typically is why not Topeka? Uh, Topeka offer, I mean, Topeka's a great town. And, you know, one of the, I guess it could be a blessing, but uh, we travel the country a lot. Um, we've been around all 50 states. We do business, and the you know, majority of our business is not in Kansas. It's in the other states where the most population is located. So um, the Midwest work ethic, uh, the values that our employees have are similar values to what we have. Um, hardworking, family driven, um, passionate about what they do. And there's just not a lot of places like that anymore, in my opinion, around the country. I'm not saying there aren't other great places, but there's just something special about Kansas, Topeka, and Midwest work ethic. And, and we, could, we, we could do business anywhere, but I couldn't imagine doing it anywhere else other than here. And uh, we're doing everything we can to make Topeka even better to attract more young talent, keep that talent you know, that's here at Washington from leaving and going to Kansas City or or somewhere else. I mean, Topeka can be a special place. I do think, too, we're uniquely situated. You know, we've got Washington right here. You've got two other universities kind of on both sides of Topeka. So the talent pool for us, we found to be just, you know, incredible from that standpoint. And, um, you know, one of the things, uh, when we moved to the new building, there was this, uh, uh, long story short, you know, I think too often, and I, and I get why the question's asked, but I wish we would all quit asking that question. <laughs> because I think it positions Topeka like in a negative way. So um, just talking about like Derek said, you know, we talked to other competitors that are all, all over the country, so California, Florida, and Arizona, and the hardest challenge that they have is finding good people. And we say all the time, that's like our competitive advantage. The reason we've done so well is because we've just got incredible people, and I think that's the, the one thing as a community that we have to accentuate and really drive and promote in a big, big way is there's just a, a work ethic and a um, integrity factor with the people here that is unmatched anywhere else that we've been. So we get to see it firsthand. We, we do mean that, it's not just for the presentation. So we, we, uh, we recently bought a competitor out in California uh, about six months ago. and. Um, I've had the opportunity to go out and spend time with them, and it's amazing. I mean, just getting their people motivated to come to work. They would much rather be on the beach or be doing something else and attracting. I mean, the talent that you do get, you get the way for them uh, because they're hard to come by, and people are always trying to snag them from you because they're few and far between. And it's I'm not trash in California, but it's just the way people are raised out there. And it's a different, it's just a different culture in the Midwest and in Topeka specifically. And the surrounding areas, we got a, a lot of amazing talent from the small communities around to begin to and you know these these two uh, were from western kansas too so not just to be good your company has grown from 45 million in annual production in 2005 to more than 5 billion in 2014 what has contributed to to, to that fantastic rate of growth our, our people <laughs> I, I mean not to to beat that in but i think uh, it's one of those things that we realized early on. You know, the company that we had worked for before had about 150, 160 employees, um, but just didn't do near the production. Some of that was just the, the culture. You know, what we tried to do is just hire really, really good people uh, and, and let them do their job. And I think by constantly focusing on that experience that we provide and empowering them to create that great experience, it's it's been the biggest advantage we have. I think. As a business owner or a business leader, you can get the business to a certain level, you know, kind of by yourself or really driving and being involved. And I think when our business really took off is when we realized that it was going to be more about the team that we could build out. And I think that was something that, that we had to learn going through the process that, you know, starting off, we, we actually used to tell the story we didn't want to have more than 50 employees ever. And that was more of the culture that we were working in before and just, you know, micromanaging people because they, they wouldn't work hard and it just wasn't a lot of fun. So it's been um, neat to have just great people that, that you can trust them to do their job and do it. So. I would agree with everything he says. I mean, it's all about your people. The three of us couldn't get anywhere near where we're at today if it wasn't for the staff. And I know it sounds simple, but the more you invest in your people, the more success you're going to have. 
Uh, often success comes with major challenges. Uh, what are some of the biggest obstacles you faced and how have you overcome them? And what challenges do you think you have uh, going forward? Well, there's a lot of them. I don't know if we've overcome them, but, um, you know, I think one of the things we've done great over the last couple of years, and there are a lot of them are sitting over here at the table, is we've built an incredible leadership team. Um, which has taken the three of us out of the day-to-day -day grind. I think when, when, you're, when you have rapid success as an owner, it's, it's very difficult to get out of that daily grind of just being inside the business too much and, and taking a step back and the three of us get off site at least once a quarter and just spend a day or two um, focusing on the vision of where the company's headed. And you know, We're able to do that a lot more now that we built the team out. Um, probably some of the best decisions we've made as a business are the things we didn't do. I, uh, with success, you have so many distractions coming at you and opportunities and people wanting to lead you down this path or here's this opportunity here and, you know, it's hard to turn away from them and some of them you could probably make some money at, uh, but it just, it'll distract the core business and, and what we're all about and it's hard to say no to a lot of those distractions. And then also, uh, making sure you're not settling for lazy or getting lazy when it comes to hiring um, and still attracting that top talent because I would say the first few employees were critical, but I think the employees we're hiring now, we have 330 employees. The employees we're hiring now, to me, are more critical to the future of the company than ever. There's the people who are going to hold the glue together, keep the culture of the company, and things like that. And I know there was a period of time when the three of us were doing a lot of the hiring. You know, this was probably three or four years ago, and we were so busy in the business, we were lazy when it came to hiring people, and we had a lot of turnover uh, for a period of time. So now that we've gotten away from that, and let the, the leadership team get more involved in that. Um, things have gotten a lot better from that standpoint, but those are just a few. I think one of the other challenges too is there's, um, I say all the time, there's, there's nothing that can really prepare you, and I hate to say this, you know, at college, but there's nothing that can really prepare you to go from, you know, three people to 330 people. And, and there's a lot of things that will come up along the way that you just don't, don't have experience. So, um, just trying to figure out, we talk all the time about trying to, you know, shortcut our way to success or to go figure it out from somebody else and, and we call it a, accelerate our learning. So if we don't know how to do something, trying to go study or find someone who does know how to do it has been probably a big way to overcome those challenges. I do think going forward, it's, um, you know, it's pretty amazing to look at the disruption of technology. I think we're always looking at that in, in the financial services uh, space and industry and how that, you know, will play into it. But just the, the speed and rate at which stuff changes today compared to what it's changed at in the past is just incredible. Um, you know, it's, it's funny, people ask us all the time, like, what's your five-year vision, ten-year vision, plans like this? We really operate almost on like a quarterly planning system. So we know what we want to do. Uh, we foundationally have three things that we know we have to do really, really well. But the rate at which stuff, uh, which stuff changes today, like we're trying to, like he said, quarterly sit down and kind of look at where things are headed. And, you know, even though the company's grown, still trying to be relatively nimble and quick to make changes and adjust as, as we see uh, opportunities out there. Regulation is always changing. I mean, we have a huge regulatory threat that could impact our business greatly that popped up at, at the end of uh, the beginning of this year. So with the Department of Labor and, and there's things like that just happening. You know, you got to be able to adjust quickly. We have a lot of uh, young people in the audience today, students. And what advice do you have for young entrepreneurs to encourage them to take a leap of faith and start a business? Furthermore, a business here in Topeka. You know, I, I'll start this with a story. We had one of our early employees um, that came to us one time. This was early on, probably 20, 20 people or so working for the company. And he felt uh, that in order to coach his son's baseball team a little bit more often and uh, things like that, that he was actually going to quit and start his own business because the 45 hours he was working was just too much. And uh, we kind of laughed at him and he, and he left. And about uh, nine months later, he was unemployed. But um, I think if you're going to decide to do it, uh, you've got to be all in. You know, there's sacrifices. You know, one of the most difficult, you mentioned challenges, probably one of the most difficult ones I know that we all deal with is that work-life family balance. Um, that can be a huge challenge. It can be very, very impactful. Um, if you're not 100% personally, you're not going to be effective in the business. And I think just given that um, message that if you decide to go do it, you've got to be all in. 
you got to make sure you have a good business plan. There's so many people that start out with, you know, something that just probably isn't going to work, and just making sure that you have something that that you can go out and market yourself and, and provide value before you take that leap of faith. Yeah, to echo what he said, it is a lot of hard work, but it's also um, I would never want to do anything else. Like it's it's absolutely the most rewarding thing that you can do. Also, so. Um, Finding something that you really love and are passionate about, I think, is a key to it too. Because if you don't, you can't start a business with the goal of making money. I mean, if you do that, that won't be enough. I mean, for some people, maybe it is, but I don't think that will be enough to keep you motivated and driving through. You know, the hours and the effort and the work that it's going to take to to make a business successful. And then the other thing, which we've repeated a lot, is just. The, the quicker you can understand that if you hire great people and get great people around you, the business is going to get a lot easier uh, is really key. And we see that a lot with our financial advisors that we work with. You know, most of them have offices with maybe somewhere between six to twenty employees. And uh, I was actually just with one yesterday, and they have they don't hire good people, and um, it's the biggest challenge. I mean, that's that's what they're facing all the time. So the better you can do in that early on. Uh, It'll, it'll make the business a lot easier to do, so, and enjoy it. Okay, one final question for me, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience for a few questions. But what is the coolest thing that you've done? What is your most your most proudest moment for advisors at Excel? What's the neatest thing that you, you've done as a company? I would say, so, personally for me, and, and then, you know, the company, I think, just in general, uh, seen it grow into what it is today and, and I think probably more than anything it, it hits us it was probably two years ago we talked about it we do a lot of like stuff for the employees and their family we had an Easter party and there was literally like 7,000 kids running around or something like that you know? <laughs> so I, I think to, um, to realize the, the impact that you can have on a lot of families and that, that they're counting on us to, to do a good job and not screw things up it is a neat responsibility Personally, um, two years ago in January, and, and you've got to remember where I grew up, a one-stop like town in, in western Kansas, right? So uh, we had President Bush at our event, and I actually sat on stage like this and interviewed him. So that was a pretty surreal, you know, whether you like Bush or not, that was a, a pretty neat um, experience. All the Democrats in the crowd loved him after he spoke. <laughs> I was going to say the employee thing too, so I won't repeat that. But um, a couple years ago in Dallas, we actually, I mentioned we have family members that still don't quite know what we do. Uh, we have a big kickoff event, like Tony talked about. We were able to bring the three of our parents um, to the event. And uh, I think for a while, our parents thought we were like, doing something illegal or something. Until they realized <laughs> I had a real business, but uh, I'm a big, big country, uh, big country music fan. We had Toby Keith. Uh, that midfield at Dallas Cowboys Stadium, Jerry's World, and it did our award ceremony and things like that for our advisors, so that was really cool. Very good. Questions from the audience? Any? Raise your hand. I think that a motivated workforce is key to uh, business success. And I found it interesting when you were, you both said that you didn't like going to work. And when you bought the California company, those people like going to the beach better. And, you know, I, I get that. How did you motivate them? Uh, we fired. We've done a lot of fired. <laughs> yeah, so I've been on drug three times since February. And we let them go be on the beach more often. <laughs> See, all the Just in general, comparing that to, to what we have, and so the last three days, I was actually I'm in this mastermind group with with some other business owners. So I got home at like 1:30 last night, so it was an early morning this morning. But you know, this was the the topic that was discussed ad nauseum over and over and over again. And you know what I told them is, um, and the guy that kind of leads this group is the the publisher publisher of Success Magazine, spends most of his time in the personal development space, and he said it well. He said. You know, as much as it pains me to say it, being in the personal development space, people don't really change. You know, they kind of are who they are. So the easiest way to get um, 
your employees motivated is to hire motivated employees. Um, so I think that's you know what we focus on more than anything is just getting the right people in place. And if you do that, like you don't have to spend much time trying to motivate them. Spend like Derek said, we spend a lot more time now trying to identify and change our hiring process to where we get the right people in to start with. And that's probably made you know the biggest difference for us. The quickest way to gain respect, you've all worked at a company where you sit next to someone that's just worthless to the company. And then we, as a, if you have leaders that don't eliminate those problems, I mean, you, the, the quickest way to gain respect is to get rid of those people and let them know that you're good, you're not going to you know put up with that anymore. You're going to put someone next to them that's going to put in the same effort that, that you are. So seems pretty elementary. Other questions? I may just have you shout them out if I need to repeat them. Other questions? Do you, do you think you might take the company public? No, we, we really don't think we'll take it public. So I think um, I think we like being able to make decisions that we think are best for the company. And if you study uh, the public markets or public companies today, it really is all about your quarterly earnings and uh, doing. You know, I think a lot of companies. There's some exceptions, like an Amazon, where he just does whatever the hell he wants and it keeps growing in value. <laughs> but you know, most companies today, if you watch, what they're so focused on is just that quarterly earnings. And I think sometimes, um, you know, I think we want the company to be a long-term legacy company that, that can have a huge impact on the community. And, and I don't know that a public um, company would be able to do that. I think we'd fear some of the things that we'd have to do. And, and quite frankly, I, you know, we've talked about it a lot. I think the only reason you take a a company public is is for the financial benefit from it, and I don't think that's really that important to, to any of the three of us. To where you know we don't want to have to be beholden to anybody <laughs> in a way, I guess. So, yeah, we wouldn't want to have to live in a box. <laughs> yeah, David. Um, you talked about the importance of your business plan. Has it also been important to change strategy, change direction along the way? Absolutely. I think that's what Cody talked about, you know, having a three or five year business plan is just, ext I think it's extremely difficult in any business, but especially ours. Um, we look at it I mean, daily, quarterly, and, and adjust all the time. So let me, I'll, I'll actually tell you a story about that that not a lot of people know. So in 2004, Dave and I left, and we were just going to go be independent financial advisors here in Topeka. And we did that. So throughout all of 2004, we started meeting with uh, potential clients and um, thought we were going to build this advisory business. Realized you know it wasn't quite as easy as we thought it was going to be. We were trying to find a great FMO broker dealer, somebody to help support us, and just didn't really see any out there. And that's when we started talking to Derek, saying like, you know, we got to just go build our own. We know that side of the business, but our our original plan, and, and this kind of speaks to that, was we wanted to build this little boutique. Um, insurance marketing organization that maybe had 40 or 50 really top advisors that we could then plug into, learn from, and build the um, advisory practice. So our original plan was a little bit more about building this great advisory practice with the you know marketing organization being kind of the secondary business there. And I think um, you know about 10 months into that, in 2005, we realized that this was going to be a lot bigger opportunity. The, the challenge was um, this was draining money like crazy, and the advisory business was making money. So, but we knew that we needed to put all our time and energy in there. So we shut that down and focused full time on that, which was you know ten months into our plan, we deviated from our plan because we saw more opportunity there. So I think as a business, being being flexible and understanding when opportunities come up and present themselves to be able to. To deviate from your plan and go jump on it is important for us, and, and it's probably more important today than, than ever. While the business plans all over the place from time to time, our core values, I think it's really important, our core values that we started the company with have never changed. We talk about them, Cody talked about them on stage at our very first event we did in March of 05, and we share the same ones today in our presentation, so I think that's really important. I, I want to know how you The question is, is, how do you know they're the right people? Um, you know, I we're going to go speak to some of the students here in a little bit. And one of the one of the topics was um, how do you get hired? And uh, I'm 
not big on resumes. Anybody can make a resume look good. You know, I think that it's, it's how you interview. It's all in how you interview. Um, one of the first questions I ask is, why should we hire you? And one of the things, I have a teenage daughter that's in high school, and one of the things I fear for that generation is they can't talk. Um, you know, they can talk great on the cell phone through text messages, but I, I tell her all the time, you can't go to an interview and do it through Snapchat. You know, so, um, having that ability to communicate and, and really sell yourself is, is what's critical, and that's one of the things that I, that I personally look at. I would say a few other things along that. Uh, we're huge on referrals, so about 65% of the employees have been referred into the company. Um, so, you know, we talk to our people all the time about we want to surround you with great people that are going to work really hard, you know, and I think that's something that just has been kind of ingrained in the culture. So the, the referrals that we get in, we tell them don't, you know, don't refer us duds. Make sure that if you're referring someone in and putting your name behind it, that they're, they're going to be a rock star. So I think that's part of it. I think the other thing that we've done uh, strategically, because like Derek said early on, you know, as your company's growing, we were doing a lot of the hiring, but the problem was we were so busy. If you walked in and, and you smiled and we thought you were going to be confident, we, we hired you pretty much. <laughs> and um, that's why our turnover was higher back then. So what, what I think we've done now is really paced and slowed down our hiring process. So. People go through four interviews with four different people before you know they're offered a job. The final interview being with us, um, so they're going to interview you know with whatever team they're going. Well, they're going to interview with our HR person. Then whatever team that they're going into, the leader of that team is going to interview them. The third interview is with someone within that team and the person, and then the final interview is us. And you know what it's it's made a difference in too is even. All the people before us do a better job now of trying to weed out people because they don't want to bring someone to us where we're like, really? You thought this was someone we should hire? So I think that's made a, a big, big difference too. So we're, where we used to be really um, fast to hire and slow to fire, we're now really slow to hire and fast to fire, I guess. Yeah, that's what we talked about. You're, you will still get some bad ones. And we talk a lot about the three of us won't recognize it because we're not in it enough or close enough to it. We talk a lot about horizontal accountability. We have this group of people that were there from the beginning. And uh, it's the employees that come to the leadership team and say, hey, this, this person is just not cutting it. Uh, they don't share the same values. They're just not a good fit. And it's amazing. It's our, our, our employees are the ones that end up ultimately, and ultimately fire them, but uh, at least bring it to people's attention that this person just isn't a good fit. So I don't want to mess up that culture we have. We could talk all morning long. We're already a quarter, almost a quarter till nine, so I, I'm sorry. I know there's lots of other questions, but I think we're going to need to kind of ring it off here. So, big round of applause. <laughs> I'm going to draw for, for some door prizes, actually, real quick before we before we send you on your way. We're giving away coffee mugs um, from the Designer Show House. Uh, how many people went to see President and Mrs. Farley's house? Terrific. It's a great fundraiser for child care aware. The executive director, Reva Wawadis, is here today. So you're going to get a coffee mug. Um, first one is for Derek Shrevey. Is Derek here? Terrific. Come forward. There's a, a gift sack here on the side of the platform. Mix them up real good here. Second one. Jan Lewenberger. Is Jan here? I saw him earlier. Yeah. Hey, Jan. And the third lucky recipient is Janet Martinick. Maybe they can bring it to you. That might be easier. Yeah, take one of those. And Kate, you'll take it to Janet. Okay, terrific. Just a couple of quick reminders of um, what's coming up here in the next uh, few days, actually, next week. As Dr. Farley mentioned, next Thursday evening is our football uh, home opener. 
So games at 6 o'clock on Thursday. Uh, we'll start our alumni tailgate party at 4.30. So if you're working, you're going to have to take off early from work to come tailgate with us. Also on October 3rd, we're hosting our annual 5K fund run that raises money for our, our alumni scholarship fund where we give scholarships to legacy students. So come out and join us for that. And then just to remind you that the next Wake Up is on November 19th with Karen Neelinger. She's a real estate developer and author that lives actually back east in uh, Connecticut and then also has a home down in Florida. So come out and see us in November for the second lineup in our Wake Up with Washburn Breakfast Lecture Series. Thank you so very much. Terrific crowd. This is a great way to kick off our Wake Up season. Have a great day. Thank you. sell yourself is, is what's critical and that's one of the things that I personally look at. I would say a few other things along that. Uh, we're huge on referrals so about 65% of the employees have been referred into the company. Um, so you know we talk to our people all the time about we want to surround you with great people that are going to work really hard you know and I think that's something that just has been kind of ingrained in the culture so the, the referrals that we get in we tell them don't you know, don't refer to studs. Make sure that if you're referring someone in and putting your name behind it, that they're they're going to be a rock star. So I think that's part of it. I think the other thing that we've done uh, strategically, because like Derek said early on, you know, as your company's growing, we were doing a lot of the hiring. But the problem was we were so busy. If you walked in and, and you smiled and we thought you were going to be confident, we hired you pretty much. And um, that's why our turnover was higher back then. So. What, what I think we've done now is really paced and slowed down our hiring process. So people go through four interviews with four different people before you know they're offered a job, the final interview being with us. Um, so they're going to interview you know, with whatever team they're going with. Well, they're going to interview with our HR person. Then whatever team that they're going into, the leader of that team is going to interview them. The third interview is with someone within that team and the person. And then the final interview is us. And you know what it's it's made a difference in too is even all the people before us do a better job now of trying to weed out people because they don't want to bring someone to us where we're like really you thought this was someone we should hire so I think that's made a, a big big difference too so where where we used to be really um, fast to hire and slow to fire we're now really slow to hire and fast to fire I guess yeah so we talked about it you you will still get some bad ones and we talk a lot about. The three of us won't recognize it because we're not in it enough or close enough to it. But we talk a lot about horizontal accountability. And we have this group of people that were there from the beginning. And uh, it's the employees that come to the leadership team and say, hey, this, this person is just not cutting it. Uh, they don't share the same values or just not a good fit. And it's amazing. It's our, our, our employees are the ones that end up ultimately, and ultimately fire them. But uh, at least bring it to people's attention that this person just isn't a good fit. So because I don't want to mess up that culture we have. We could talk all morning long. We're already a quarter, almost a quarter till nine, so I, I'm sorry. I know there's lots of other questions, but I think we're going to need to kind of ring it off here. So big round of applause.